into this. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yes. Before we hop into the topic today, um, we do want to put a trigger warning at the top. A massive trigger warning. <laughs> yeah. We're going to be discussing um, a, a criminal case where somebody was charged with um, potentially engaging in or talking about engaging in uh, kidnapping, rape, abuse, um, sadomasochism, um, cannibalism, and everything that goes along with that. Um, nothing happens to children in this in this episode, but it is um, there are discussions of like graphic depictions and um, and things like that. So if it's a lot. You're, yeah, if you're not in a space where you can hear that, um, we totally understand. And um, you can just listen to a different episode instead. <laughs> yeah. Highly recommend a different episode. Yeah. I recommend episode 42 where we just talk about animal testicles. Um, There's a lot of animal testicles in that episode. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's our trigger warning for this episode. And let's get into it. Are you ready? Yeah. So back in um, uh, April... Uh, it was when the episode came out, titled, you know, The Girl Meat. And uh, one of those weird and, you know, thoughts that I have where I ask and I get that look from Katie, like, what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah. And so that happened. And so I was supposed to research something else for this episode and I didn't want to. Yeah. So <laughs> I put off researching depression for a good long time. <laughs> and then it took me days. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, yeah, so I did this instead, and it was the right choice. So this is the story of G- Gilberto, Gilberto Valley, um, or Gilberto Valley, if you want to be Italian with it. What was the name of the documentary? The name of the documentary, it was on HBO, it's called Thought Crimes, The Case of the Cannibal Cop. Yeah. And was released in 2015. And I think I probably saw this documentary back when it came out. Mm -hmm. So I have not seen it in quite a while. I just remember highlights. And he was arrested initially in 2012. So. Yeah. So it's 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 an older case. Yeah. Like 10 years old. Mm -hmm. So this is actually a quote from the Second Circuit Court of Appeals decision, but I thought it was a good summary. So I'm just going to read it. Gaberto Valley is a native of Forest Hills, Queens. Uh, At the time of the events giving rise to his prosecution, he was an officer in the New York City Police Department, living with his wife, Kathleen Mangan, and their infant daughter in Forest Hills. Valley has no prior criminal history, and there is no evidence that he ever acted violently or threateningly towards anyone. Valley was, however, an active member of an internet sex fetish community called Dark Fetish Network, or DFN. He connected with individuals around the world whom he knew only by screen names such as Moody Blues or Ali Khan or by email addresses. Valley communicated with these individuals by email or web chat, usually in the late evening and early morning hours after his work shift. Many of his internet communications involved the transmission of photographs of women he knew, including his wife, her colleagues from work, and some of his friends and acquaintances. I didn't know that part. Oh, yeah. I have already forgot to other DFN users with whom he discussed committing horrific acts of sexual violence. These chats consisted of gruesome and graphic descriptions of kidnapping, torturing, cooking, raping, murdering, and cannibalizing various women. So then I watched the HBO documentary. Oh, God. So uh, at the time he was turned in in 2012, he's 28 years old. His wife actually turned him in to the police or FBI after she put spyware on his computer um, because she was like, apparently she went on to a, a shared laptop, saw some like disturbing fucking images and was like, that's fucking crazy. Put this spyware in and discovered that he had this online activity in fetish forums where he explicitly described kidnapping, raping, murdering and eating Various women that he actually knew, including his wife. That's so uh, good for her, man. That's she like found it and turned him in that day. Like left and turned him in. Damn, good yeah. for her. Like, oh, I know, crazy. Major props. Also, like, I can't imagine having a kid with somebody who's well. Apparently, doing that online at the time that she discovered this, they she they were like in the documentary, like showing text messages between him and her after she had left. 
And she said something like, you know, I've known you for three years, but I feel like I don't know you at all. Fair. But also, she's known him for three years and they're married and have like a one have a child. Old. Like, yeah. that is fucking fast. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's taken us 12 years to get to that point. <laughs> Yeah, like, after that's... two years, I'm just moving in with my yeah, partner. <laughs> yeah, like I, that is crazy when I, I, you see other timelines and you're like, man, they're on like warp speed. Yeah, terrifying. So you know, that's Get something to, know to be somebody. said for taking your time, I guess. That's oh. I forgot that he was married with a child, mm -hmm. and um, he was also accused of using NYPD computers to search for women that he could. <laughs> use in these fantasies like he would look up their addresses and stuff oh my like, god yeah. they interviewed both of his parents in this documentary his mother initially ex explained this behavior as he was blowing off steam the way some people hit a punching bag at the gym but she was also crying as she said this <laughs> <laughs> so. it, that, it's just locker room talk guys yes his father said that Gilberto himself, the defendant, he, like he created a monster and mentioned how his son was a great writer who could and said, who could believe he did this to a hundred women, but also acknowledged that then the question is because he used women he actually knows is like, well, which one was he putting on the spit over the fire and which one was he putting in the oven and which one was in his trunk? So, like, because he was using – basically, his dad was like, well, the problem is that they weren't just, like, imaginary women altogether. They were, like, actual women who, right. were, like, he's been in their homes and stuff. And, like, just the thought of, like, somebody having – it puts a different spin on, like, photos that you're sharing on social media when this guy is using this for these really dark, mm -hmm. gross purposes. Yeah. Ew. <laughs> Ew, I hate him. <laughs> um, he, Valley said also, so in the prosecution of him, there were 24 online chats um, through this forum or through emails that described various fantasies. And in three of those 24 chats, the prosecution was like, those three conversations, he wasn't just fantasizing. Like, he was actually making plans. Yeah, there was plans. Right. right. Um... And they show, like, some transcripts of it. And basically, he says something like, if he was certain he would not be caught, he would go through with it. So that was kind of, like, the crux of the prosecution's argument is, like, like no, he was, like, for sure doing this. Alan Dershowitz is, like, a famous attorney. Mm -hmm. He was interviewed in this documentary. Wasn't he one of Trump's Probably. people? Um, I meant to look up his whole thing, but I think he's a professor at Harvard as yeah. well, or at least he was in 2015. He's a real um, dirtbag, isn't he? Probably. probably. <laughs> um, he had a lot of plaque on his lower teeth. <laughs> that's what I noticed. Mm -hmm. Anyway, but he was explaining the nuance of a he's conspiracy. he's not chewing enough hard food. <laughs> <laughs> he was explaining the nuance of a conspiracy charge. So he was charged, Valley was charged with conspiracy to commit kidnapping and mm -hmm. misuse or violation of this uh, federal um, like computer fraud and abuse act, CFAA. But for the conspiracy charge, he was basically saying like, okay, so say you're charged with attempted murder, attempted kidnapping. You've not only intend to do the crime, but you also have to go beyond preparation. You have to take steps to show that you are absolutely right. going to commit that crime unless something completely outside your control stepped in and stopped you from committing the crime. So, like, attempted kidnapping is, like, when somebody – you see those videos of, like, somebody in a van trying to grab a kid off the street and the kid fights them off. Right. They didn't kidnap the kid, but they f attempted to. Right. Um if things have been slightly different, they would have. Um, so conspiracy moves that finish line back. An overt act can be another crime or it can be something that is otherwise legal, but in the context of what you intend to do with mm -hmm. that activity, it has a special meaning. Mm -hmm. So for example, you and I decide we want to rob a bank, but we need a getaway car that's not, what, that's not registered to us. Yeah. So I steal a car. Well, stealing a car is always illegal. <laughs> 
But also the reason I'm stealing it is to rob a bank. Right. So that's where it's conspiracy to rob a bank. And then also. In addition to yeah. stealing the car. Yeah. So, but also we need disguises for this. So you go to the costume shop uh-huh. and you buy us wigs and like some sunglasses or disguises of some yeah. sort. Buying those wigs and everything is legal every single day of the year. You can do that no matter yes. what. However. When you're doing it in the course of planning a robbery. Right. You yeah. were doing it in order to use them to rob a bank. Yep. That becomes an overt act for to prove conspiracy to rob a bank. Right. Like steps being taken to execute this plan. Right. So <clears throat> anyway. That's You'd be just... really bad at robbing a bank for the record. You probably like giggle through it. I can't think of two worse people to rob a bank, I'll be honest. <laughs> so no worries, local banks. <laughs> we won't bother. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> um so anyway, that's just a little bit of an explanation of the difference between like an attempted kidnapping versus conspiracy to commit kidnapping. Um that I thought would be helpful yeah. for the rest of this conversation. Um because it, it winds up being like the crux of this. Mm-hmm case ultimately yeah and uh so on these online forums the uh, valley talked about using chloroform to disable his victims um and knock them out and then google searched how to make chloroform he used the nypd databases to search addresses of at least one of his proposed victims so in addition to the conspiracy charges, he was charged with the misuse of NYPD databases and that CFAA charge, which is a misdemeanor. Um, he also That's That's had... That's a misdemeanor. Yep. Uh, <laughs> yep, it is. Um, he also had a plan that he called a blueprint and like lists of items that he would have needed to acquire in order to um, like accomplish the kidnapping rape murder and cannibalizing of these victims um but there was no evidence that he actually tried to acquire any of those items did he um was he also targeting like other like people that were in the system because they were victims of other crimes i don't think so okay i feel like there might have been a law and order episode Yes, there was a Law and Order episode, and they based were targeting. Yeah, and I think that person was targeting like probably victims. Of I didn't watch crimes. the Law and Order episode. I'm um, probably just that's what my brain is doing. But anyway, go ahead. Uh, he also had conversations on the FetishNet website about stalking women, and was discussing the price he would charge to another user for giving that user the address of the proposed victim, and like said. He was going to charge $4,000. The other person said, could you do three? And he said, basically, like, man, it's my head on the line. Like, it's my neck on the line if this doesn't work out perfectly. And then you're going to eat me. <laughs> <laughs> like, so basically he was like, the price is the price. But, like, that price was because he knew it was high risk to be getting that information and then giving it to somebody. Um. But so the government argued, because this was in federal court, the government argued that his Google searches were the overt acts. Mm -hmm. Um, And the documentary was asking, like, well, Googling is kind of like an extension of just a thought you have in your head. It's not really, like, proof, especially, I think, for purposes of a conspiracy charge. That's the question. It's, it's, It's not like for Casey Anthony after the fact, she's looking up like how to clean up dead body smells. Right. And like bullshit like that. It's so it's not more evidence that a crime has been committed. Rather, right. they're trying to use it as this evidence that a crime would have been committed. Right. Um and the documentary also, I think it's kind of reasonable. They posit the idea that like Stephen King, an author who has made millions by writing about extremely graphic and violent incidences Mm -hmm. is not guilty of any of the, of the crimes described in his books. Yeah. So, you know, to that extent, it's like, well, if he's just like writing about this in an online forum, like a creepy pasta, like a fan, like a fan fiction almost. Right. Then like, you know, is it, it dances with a free speech issue. Right. And, and, but I can also, I mean, the flip side of that is I can also see if his wife had just left him when this happened instead of going to the authorities and like pursuing this. I can also see this guy devolving and just getting further into this. He claims territory. His wife. And then doing it. 
he claims in the documentary that his wife installed the spyware. Um, and then 12 to 24 hours later, he signed off of those forums completely and had decided that he was already done with it and then she had already seen everything oh that's really fucking convenient yeah basically so according to him he's just like the unluckiest man on earth that this was discovered and right basically though like when she was reviewing and that's the other thing like she's reviewing this spyware and somehow manages while working full-time and having a newborn child to review everything that the spyware finds and it finds some email address that she didn't know about. So she goes to whatever Yahoo and uses the password that he told her is the password he uses for everything and logs right in and then finds all the pictures that he was sending to people. And yeah, all what you're stuff. guilty of is being dumb. So like, I just don't think that that happened within a 24 hour period, but that's what he said in the documentary. So like, yeah, I mean, probably not, but the outcome is the same. Mm-hmm. And, and I firmly believe that, if he continued to be involved in this and he just, I just feel like when something like that happens where there's less oversight of you and you don't have to answer to somebody else, you just sink deeper into things like that. So I, I mean, yes and no, look at Josh Duggar. He had that shit. Ugh. He ha- he knew that that was on his computer and he was still doing it. Ew. So, mm, you know, speaking of ew. Yeah. So, um, if you don't know about Josh Duggar, um, and you're listening to this, uh, Someplace Underneath is another podcast that did an amazing, like, six-part series on the IBLP. Oh, interesting, yeah. It, it was so good. Yeah. But they did all of the IBLP um, and, like, culminated. They did a, a lot of talk about the Duggars throughout, but then culminated in Josh Duggar and what he was arrested and then ultimately convicted for. I think it was actually recorded before he was convicted, but he had been arrested. Mm-hmm. Um. But yeah, excellent series. It's in their first season, so um, it, it's towards the beginning part of their catalog. Mm-hmm. Their first few episodes are about Shelley Miscavige going missing, and oh, that's a crazy one too. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, it's called Someplace Underneath, and it's part of the Last Podcast Network. Um, so anyway, he was convicted, and um, he was convicted of attempt uh, conspiracy to commit attempt uh, kidnapping and violation of the CFAA, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Um, and the concern in this case is that uh, Valley was a police officer and was using the databases that he had exclusive access to by virtue of his job as a police officer um, to get information on his, you know, imaginary, quote unquote, would be victims and imaginary but people that he knows there's also evidence that he was accessing this dark fetish website from his iphone while on the clock like while on duty yeah so um that's like a whole other aspect of this is not only and it goes that conversation which is of, like fucking taxpayer waste at the basis at the basis like, yeah, at, the, at the very bottom but like know, if but, you're yeah. supposed to be enforcing laws should you not be held to a higher standard than the civilians who you're supposed to be serving and protecting. I mean, I think so, but, you know, they also have qualified immunity if they murder people while they're working. Right. I mean, it's just like, uh, and not to, like, totally derail this, but I just read this article about a local police department that is trying to do away with psych evaluations. (laughs) Oh, good. (laughs) Because, because everybody was failing them. So, like, we should just get rid of them because the failure rate is too high. Not give people therapy. Not be more stringent because so many people are failing them. <laughs> um, so he was convicted. Um, there was some talk in the documentary that uh, they thought that the jurors were less concerned with the burden of proof, which in a criminal case is beyond a reasonable doubt, mm-hmm. um, and more concerned with the what if we don't convict this person and then he does something. Like Minority Report, where they were arresting people for like before the crime was committed. Correct. Yeah. Um, and, but that being said, you know, I understand the jury's concern because he's a police officer, was already abusing the access that he was having to the, these databases. And then, um, on top of it, you know, yeah, you know, you, you do something where, okay, so he's acquitted and he can probably get his job back because he's union. And his pension. Right. And so then you're, you're not doing anything to stop the problem. And he can say like, Oh, it's just a fetish. It was just a fetish and I'm done with it. I'm done with it. 
like you can say that all you want, but like, you know, you're asking a jury to believe that. And I think, you know, the things that he was describing, even the court, there was a court sketch artist um, that they interviewed and she was like, I don't really get to draw nudes very often and certainly not like this. And she had like the sketches and there's these like extreme bondage situations. And, you know, they showed um, like screenshots from these websites and it's like, it's not just like that not tying fetish or anything. Like right. these people were hanging yeah. from these different not situations. There was like deep fakes of a naked woman beheading another naked woman that was like hog tied. What the fuck? Um, there, you know, so there were all these different things where it's like at a certain point and they talked, uh, I mentioned a little bit later. So the defense, uh, their forensic psychologist is this guy, Dr. Park Dietz. Um, he's a forensic psychologist and he was hired by the defense and he drew a conclusion after interviewing the defendant that he was doing nothing more than fantasizing. However, the documentary points out that they didn't present him as a witness at the trial. And somebody said like, yeah, well, he would have been eviscerated on cross-examination because he had actually like published articles, um, about how extremely violent fantasies, um, sexually violent intention people with sexually violent intentions and like not just intentions but like offenders to be Mm -hmm. may seek out law enforcement jobs because of their ability to more easily access prey that was my next on that role when you know when you're talking about the jury feeling like what if that's how i would feel on the jury is like so we let this guy go Mm -hmm. and he's gonna feel more emboldened Mm -hmm. in his ability to get away with this which means the super, super vulnerable population he has access to is, like, even more at risk. And you're in that from from all the other authority position as well. Right. So, yeah. Oh, my God. It's just so scary to think about. Yeah. And, I mean, like, there's – there is an aspect to it where it's, like, like, if I'm in danger and I run up to a cop, I do expect to be helped. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I say that as a white woman. So, like, right. yeah, block of salt with that. Yeah. But, like <laughs> – you're in a uniform. I, I expect yes. to get help when I'm in danger. Because that's your job. Right. But if I yeah. run to you and you have this like disturbed grin on your face because that's your buddy chasing me and you're going to tie me up and put me in a fucking oven when I'm still alive, then what the fuck? You know, yeah. like what, you know, it's just crazy. It's like, it's like someone who is a pedophile becoming a pediatrician. Mm-hmm. I mean, it it's like, it it takes something that's already predatory by nature and you're adding an element of like long-term planning to it that yes i think you're going to execute on all of these things because you are setting yourself up for success and long term it's it's um you know i think also the difference is that you know he's in these forums he's not watching you know bdsm porn He's right. not watching – I mean, he might have also been doing that as well. But it's not just watching the pornography. He was, like, describing why that pornography was not enough. Like, he wanted more and being extremely oh, yeah. detailed. Oh, I'm going to get a place upstate. It, you know, there's no neighbors for three miles around. We can build a fire outside and put them on the spit. Oh, my God. Like, he had a whole plan for stuff. And, like, no one will be able to hear her screens because nobody's around. And we go this time of year, then definitely no one's out there, da 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 Right. And it's like... And how easy would it be for a guy who works on the NYPD to pick up a runaway teenager? Totally. Or two. Yeah. In a, on a random day. I mean, it's just like the... I think the NYP, like the, the police officer aspect just makes it that, like it's an unsettling case to begin with when you add that aspect yeah. of, you know, you and should be held does, to a higher standard. Yeah. I think, I think that that raises the stakes Definitely. for the jury and I mean, it raises the stakes for everybody involved, but I think it'd be the same thing if it was a teacher, you know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. like you're, you have access to this vulnerable, vulnerable community or a healthcare whenever you worker want. or, and, yeah. you know, you, we can't trust you to not abuse that access now. Right. Um, you In know, like whether it's most your fetish or terrible not. Terrible ways. Right. Um, and, you know, I think part of that was also that he was using photos of women he actually knew. That's another part like, that's like And really like upsetting. basically trading a picture of his wife to these guys and saying like look this one will be tasty and like oh my God. 
like it's fucking gross. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. like yeah. So anyway, but also, so Dr. Dietz had given this statement. They didn't put him on the stand, but he did um, argue that the defendant was just coping with those urges by accessing the fetish sites. I just pulled a muscle rolling my eye. And in a counterpoint was made in the documentary by uh, someone else. I didn't get their name, but saying that exercising the neural pathways of those urges by engaging in online fetish websites creates an addiction to those pathways in your brain, making a habitual pattern out of the violent sexual deviant behavior, especially when you, quote, think you're exercising control over those urges by what you're doing, which then, because it's an addiction, you have to continuously up the ante to get that same thrill. Yeah. And it's Army Hammer starting with, you know, Mm -hmm. this not tying thing and evolving to, can I find a doctor to remove your rib so I can barbecue and eat it? Yeah. Tune into Patreon for that one. Oh yeah. I forgot that was a Patreon episode. (laughs) I was thinking it was like a regular episode. Nope. Whoops. Um, (laughs) But basically this other psychologist was saying that it creates elevated pleasurable stimuli in the brain with poor judgment, which creates a perfect storm of causing problems for yourself by engaging in this, this deviant behavior. Yeah. So anyway, the defendant was convicted. Valley was convicted and, um, he appealed the conviction. Uh, he filed a motion for acquittal. Uh, it's called a, a judgment, notwithstanding the verdict, uh, motion because basically his, his attorneys were arguing on appeal that the evidence in the case could not support the, the verdict that the ju- the jury came to. Mm-hmm. So as a matter of law, there's no way that they could have gotten there. And basically, because the standard is beyond a reasonable doubt, that's what this case kind of like hinged on. And it frequently does mm-hmm. with criminal cases. And there's a ton of case law for it. Like it's settled case law, like beyond a reasonable doubt. It's an impossibly high standard for this reason, because the idea that you're taking away somebody's freedom, you need to be sure. Right. And so like there's... I understand that it's like, this guy's like walking free and it's like, okay, well, first of all, he, he didn't commit a crime. He definitely invaded privacy of people, but he didn't actually harm anybody, physically harm anybody. Right. Um, and so, you know, to take away his freedom, like you need to be super duper fucking sure. Right. And it's just, um, so like fundamentally I agree with the beyond a reasonable doubt standard. I think most attorneys do agree with it as well. Mm -hmm. The problem is that a jury of your peers, you know, your jury is not legally trained people, generally speaking, and a jury can make a decision based on their emotions. Yeah. And sometimes you want that. And sometimes you don't. As long as they all agree. Yeah. Depending on what side you're on. And so you end up with these cases. So he appealed um, and asked for, he asked for acquittal on all charges, but um, arguing that he was engaged in online only fantasy role play. The judge, uh, the trial judge in U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York granted the motion for acquittal on the conspiracy to kidnap charge, finding that the prosecutors failed to prove beyond a reasonable doubt the defendant and his alleged co-conspirators had entered into a conspiracy to kidnap or that the defendant had formed the required specific intent to kidnap. So this is sort of like the difference between saying, it's funny you mentioned this, would you sell your rib for $40 million? (laughs) Although, (laughs) that's you giving that example. Yeah. I thought that was like an expert said, and I was like, what? How much did they say? This is me explaining it. Gotcha, gotcha, So it's like saying the difference between saying, would you sell your ribs for $40 million and then actually taking steps to buy your ribs for $40 million. Right. So um, we're allowed to say- I'll sell all my ribs. (laughs) We're allowed to say, yeah, sure, I'd do that without it being a crime because we don't have the requisite mens rea. Mens rea is Latin for evil mind. Yep. Um, Also see Legally Blonde. Um, You know, she picked the dangerous one because she's not afraid of a challenge. (laughs) Um, so, um, so that's the specific intent. Like he needed to actually intend to do it. And they kept mentioning in the trial and in this documentary that the defendant and his alleged, you know, um, Valley and his alleged co-conspirators, these other people on these forums 
would say like, okay, we're going to meet up on Tuesday and stalk this girl. And then Tuesday would come and go and they didn't do anything. And then they just pick up where they left off and they're like, okay, like when she's leaving the gym and she's already tired and then we're going to do da, 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 da. And then they'd go back into the role play thing. So it's like, okay, well they kept talking about it, but like all these dates like came and went and none of them were like, what the fuck, man? I was waiting there all day. Right. And like, there was no evidence that he actually went to the, the intersection, the street corner that they were supposed to go to and actually stalk this woman or right. whatever. So, um, <clears throat> in another expert, uh, or another excerpt from the appellate decision from the second circuit court of appeals, agent Walsh, who was the FBI agent that was tasked with this investigation testified that he, along with the prosecutors, um, and other case agents reviewed all of the emails and chats and found that were found on his computer, including his conversations with 21 of the 24 individuals whom he met on DFN and determined that those were fantasy. At the same time, the prosecution team concluded that Valley's conversations with the three alleged co-conspirators contained what they termed, quote, elements of real crime because they described dates, names, and activities that you would use to conduct a real crime, unquote. There was no evidence that Agent Walsh or any of the other members of the prosecution team had any specialized training or experience that would render them particularly competent to distinguish between real and fantasy chats. Indeed, Agent Walsh conceded that the fantasy role play chats and emails shared many of the same features as the real chats and emails that purportedly reflected criminal intent, including dates for planned kidnappings, conjured acts of sexual violence, uh, prior surveillance that valley fantasized about having conducted and fantastical elements such as human-sized ovens and rotisseries for cooking victims um so all of these chats had all of these same elements to them Mm -hmm. and on review the trial judge concluded that there was no substantive difference between the quote fantasy chats and the three chats that were deemed to have been evidence of conspiracy and therefore the jury did not follow the rule of law when convicting the defendant on the conspiracy charge based on the standard of proof of beyond a reasonable doubt. However, the trial judge did con- did affirm the CFAA charge for using the NYPD databases. At that point, um, Valley had already been um, held because he was um, in pretrial holding Um, before the hearing. So he had already been held for a total of 21 months. So he was released with an ankle bracelet on house arrest, basically, um, pending a further appeal. Uh, He was supposed to have, with the CFAA charge, uh, one year of uh, supervised release. Mm -hmm. So that was the one year of house house arrest. And then he would have been done because it was just a misdemeanor charge. Yeah. Um, So he appealed, the defendant appealed the lack of uh, the refusal to overturn the CFAA charge, the prosecutors appealed acquitting him of the conspiracy charge to the second circuit court of appeals. Um, <clears throat> and the introduction, this was actually a very well-written decision. Oh yeah. <laughs> like lower federal court decisions are usually much nicer to read, certainly than Supreme court decisions. But this one was like, Just well-written. I really enjoyed it. (laughs) And I hate reading case law. (laughs) So it starts out with uh, this whole next two paragraphs are like a big block quote, but it was just so well done. So, um, and of course, this case is in the show notes. Um, This is a case about the line between fantasy and criminal intent. Although it is increasingly challenging to identify that line in the internet age, it still exists and must be rationally discernible in order to ensure that a person's inclinations and fantasies are his own and beyond the reach of the government. We are loath to give the government the power to punish us for our thoughts and not our actions. That includes the power to criminalize an individual's expression of sexual fantasies, no matter how perverse or disturbing. Fantasizing about committing a crime, even a crime of violence against a real person whom you know, is not a crime. This does not mean that fantasies are harmless. To the contrary, fantasies of violence against women are both a symptom of and a contributor to a culture of exploitation, a massive social harm that demeans women. Yet we must not forget that in a free and functioning society, not every harm is meant to be addressed with a federal criminal law. Because the link between fantasy and intent is too tenuous for fantasy alone to be probative. 
and because the remaining evidence is insufficient to prove the existence of an illegal agreement or Valley's specific intent to kidnap anyone, we affirm the district court's judgment of acquittal on a single count of conspiracy to kidnap. And I just thought that that was so well put. Yeah, uh, like, especially that first half was, like, really well written. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I think that that really well summarized the idea that, like, yeah, no, this is a question of, like, at what point does a Google search turn criminal? Right. Um, and I think you could also, you know, impose that into the pedophile realms. Like, it's not a yep. crime to think pedophilic thoughts. It's a crime to act on them either right. by seeking out CSAM or producing it or engaging right. in child sex abuse. Um, so I think... I think that it it was well written, but it's it's just a frustrating thing because, again, this was a police officer, and it's I a think, very frustrating thing. Yeah, I mean it's it's, and I remember what, when I watched the documentary, you you swing both ways like yeah. so extremely. You watch it and you're like, "Fuck this guy," and then you're listening to like the defense and you're like, "Well, yeah, the, the thought crime. Like, I see what they mean. Like, what are we what are we prosecuting here? Because he didn't actually act on anything." Mm-hmm. Um, but at the same time, <laughs> I mean, I'm assuming he does not have custody of his child and oh my might God. have supervised visits, but I have no idea. Did you know that, um, John Mulaney was his neighbor? No. Yeah. He was on, you know, Jimmy Fallon does that like two truths. Yeah. Two lies and a, whatever it is. Um, and that was one of the things that John Mulaney wound up like explaining it, but he was neighbors with this guy. Jesus. Before he got arrested. Um, so on the issue of the CFAA conviction, um, Valley was convicted because he, quote, exceeded authorized access, uh, and the court had to determine, uh, if, whether you can be found guilty of violating the CFAA if you access a computer with an improper purpose to obtain or alter information that you are otherwise authorized to access, or if you exceed your authorized access when you obtain or alter information that you do not have authorization to access for any purpose, which happens to be on a computer that you have permission to use. So the facts of that charge were, as an NYPD officer, Valley had access to the Omnix Force Mob... Mob... All right, so I don't know if it's mobile or mobile. <laughs> or mobile. <laughs> right. <laughs> But whatever, he had access to this thing, a computer program that allows officers to search various restricted databases, including the Federal National Crime Information Center database, which yeah. contains sensitive information about individuals such as home addresses and dates of birth. It is undisputed that the NYPD's policy, known to Valley at the time, was that these databases could only be accessed in the course of an officer's official duties and that accessing them for personal use violated department rules. Which is like any database like that with information in it. Everybody has to. There's like a disclaimer. I mean, we that have that at work. Every right. time we open that one program right. in particular. Yeah. It comes up like, hey, you can't use this just to fuck around. Like, yeah. Like we could get fired for looking up our own case. Right. If we wanted. Right. Like if we had a, a claim or whatever. Right. Um, and the same thing happens. I know that that was like a huge thing when my mom was a nurse. That like a nurse mm -hmm. got fired for that. For looking mm -hmm. up her own medical record. Mm -hmm. Um. Because she didn't have access, like that was unauthorized access, yeah. um, which is crazy, just from like a healthcare perspective. But like, yeah, like whatever. Let me see my own information. But yeah. Um, in any event, in May 2012, Valley accessed the OFM database thing, the computer program, and searched for Maureen Hardigan, a woman he had known since high school and had discussed kidnapping with Ali Khan, one of the aliases on the website. This access with no law enforcement purpose is the basis for the CFAA charge. Yeah. So um, the Second Circuit ultimately granted Valley's motion for acquittal of the CFAA charge because it found that the district court's interpretation of the law violated the rule of lenity. Now, this rule, it's a common law rule. It dates back like hundreds of years, meaning that it's not written in statute uh, to be common law. And it essentially holds that if there's any ambiguous language in a statute, the benefit of that ambiguity must be read in the defendant's favor. Except when he's planning on kidnapping and eating people. Well, we actually use this rule in a bunch of different aspects. So we use it in contract law. Mm -hmm. If you want to enforce a contract against somebody like, 
okay, so like landlord tenant law, if the tenant is like, no, you didn't fucking tell me that. And the landlord's like, well, I, you know, I point to this section of the, the lease agreement and you're like, that's not what that means. And you have this dispute over what that section of your, yeah. your lease means. Tie goes to the runner. The tenant wins that because the tenant didn't write the lease agreement. Right. So it's, we have this rule that we apply to all sorts of situations right. and to the extent that it's like, okay, well, the government wants to enforce this law. If the government wants it to be specific, it's on them to make it specific. Yeah. Um, so you're guilty of violating CFAA. The, the statute currently reads, this is 18 USC section 1030 uh, A2B, if you really want to look it up. Go nuts. Um <laughs> But you're guilty of violating the CFAA if you, quote, intentionally access a computer without authorization or exceed authorized access and thereby obtain information from any department or agency of the United States, unquote. The problem is that without authorization is not defined. And because he's a member of the NYPD, he has authorization to access well, the database. Well, kind of. So when the courts are asked to decide whether a statute applies – um, to a given situation, they turn to a few different means of interpretation. The first one is the plain meaning rule, which is um, you use the plain meaning of the language. Mm -hmm. Basically, we don't need to sit here and argue over the meaning of the word dwelling or home when there are generally accepted definitions. Like, we don't need to have a whole fucking court case about it. Yeah. This is why most statutes that you read will have, like, the first section of the statute is like, this is a law for... The Computer Fraud and Abuse Act to control computer fraud. And computer then... Computer fraud is defined as... Sec yeah, this, section two this. is definitions, and they go yeah. through all these terms. That makes sense. Which is why that's there. And it's... it's so in... there's no poop hole loophole. Exactly. <laughs> and... <laughs> we laughed too hard at that. <laughs> you laughed too hard at how seriously I took it. <laughs> yes, I did. So the second way that they can interpret a statute is the legislative intent rule. In this rule, the courts will look at the legislative history of the law. So when the law is in committee and being argued in Congress, they'll look at the different versions of the bill. If any hearings were had on the bill, the transcripts for the hearings, um, they look at all of that documentation, which is for me a bitch to research. There are some attorneys who are super good at researching le legislative history. I'm not one of those people. I, just I never... feel like it's um, it would be like clicking Wikipedia links, and then it just leads to something else, which leads to something else, and then it's like, how did I get here? And to you're me, it's to... just very piecemeal. Yeah, like you're looking at like the bill jacket, and then the bill jacket says to go to this. It's just like this whole thing, and it's not for me. But um... <clears throat> in any event, they look at what the legislators um wanted the bill to say what they said the intent of the bill was in these hearings because when you're having these conversations it doesn't necessarily translate to a concise professional looking bill right but there is context to like correct and it'll provide that context right. if they have like when they have those um open senate hearings where like stephen colbert or like mr rogers testifies right and they'll talk about like this is why this issue is important this is why it matters yada yada, yada. Mm -hmm. so or bob barker or bob barker <laughs> <laughs> having into a, Patreon. Having a fight with Betty White. <laughs> I still, I'm like really, that's another intrusive thought I have. I think about that like at least once a week. I'm like, <laughs> I, I want to know. Somebody tell me. Um, so they look at all that to see if the language in question that's at the issue with this, with the whatever case is in front of the judge, if that was ever discussed in the legislative history. So the reason though for that approach as tedious as it is, is the separation of powers. Mm -hmm. So it's up to the legislature to legislate. And it's not – no branch of our three branches of government it's, can be any more powerful than the other. So for <laughs> – which means that the judicial branch cannot rewrite a statute. If mm -hmm. the legislature doesn't like how the statute ends up being applied, then the legislature needs to amend the statute. Um, so – that's why they look to the legislative intent and the, the the history of the bill to determine how it should be interpreted and applied to any specific fact pattern. Uh, so when neither of those first two rules of interpretation work, there's the rule of lenity. Basically, like I said, it's the tie goes to the runner. Um, 
when the statute is found to be ambiguous, the least oppressive interpretation, especially when it comes to criminal liability, is the interpretation that's used. Mm-hmm. Um, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals said in their decision, the deficiency of a rule that revokes authorization of an employee uh, when an employee uses his access for a purpose contrary to the employer's interests is apparent. Such a rule would mean that any employee who checked the latest Facebook posting or sporting event scores in contravention of his employer's use policy would be subject to the instantaneous secession of his agency and, as a result, would be left without any authorization to access his employer's computer systems. No, thank you. Yeah, we do not think Congress intended the imposition of criminal penalties for such a frolic. Which... They also, in, in this decision from the Second Circuit, they discussed the history of the CFAA, and it was passed in, like, the 80s, and their concern was hacking, like computer hacking. So right, when they passed the this law... The use of computers has changed significantly since the 80s. Exactly. And there has been a couple amendments since then, but yeah. so they go through the different amendments, but they talk, like, at its core, this was, like, a hacking thing, and, like, using this computer to access information is not about, like... I, oh, there, I got an email and there's a sale that ends before my shift ends. I'm going to go buy the right. one thing that's been in my shopping cart for months or whatever. Um, so the appeals court refused to allow a broad interpretation of the CFAA in this case, basically because of the consequences for the rest of everybody else, <laughs> everyone else who uses a computer. So <laughs> he was... What about the girl meat guy? <laughs> so <laughs> Valley was acquitted of all charges um, but I will note that O.J. Simpson was also acquitted, so, like... <laughs> the glove didn't fit, guys. <laughs> right. And, uh, but either way, <laughs> in, uh, 2018, Valley released his debut horror novel called A Gathering of Evil, and, uh, the summary of this book from Amazon is Gil Valley, a former NYPD patrol cop who rose to infamy in 2012 after he was wrongfully arrested by the feds for allegedly plotting to kidnap, cook, and eat women, fleshes out his fantasies in this debut novel, A Gathering of Evil, serving up a feast of gut-churning horror. Sarah McConnell and Jennifer Miller are two young and attractive New Yorkers leading seemingly normal lives. Unbeknownst to them, they have been targeted by a group of wealthy and violent sadists who meet through the dark web and share some rather unusual and deviant sexual desires, along with a desire to turn those twisted fantasies into reality. Marilyn and Bruce, the wealthy couple from upstate New York who have organized the event, have gathered this group of people from all different backgrounds and brought them together through a common bond, the lust and desire to kidnap a young woman and brutally end her life. The hunt is on. Will the prey survive this gathering of evil? Warning. This book contains graphic and violent material. It is intended for mature audiences only. So, the ratings of this book. <laughs> the It's got to be terrible. Do you want to guess the star rating? The overall star rating? Two and a half. No. Higher? Mm-hmm. Three and a half. out of five. (laughs) So the, um, the most recent review is from March, 2019, and it's a four star review. It says a gathering of evil certainly isn't for those weak of heart or those not familiar with extreme horror slash splatter punk from the first page. You're sucked into a world darker than you can possibly imagine. The author pulls no punches when it comes to the violence or the descriptions of what the characters are put through. Highly recommend this title. I'm certainly a fan and look forward to what the author comes up with next. Next uh, is going to be when he fucking kidnaps and eats somebody. That's what's going to come next. Spoiler Um, alert. Amazon. The... Another review, it's five stars, titled Horrifying, Disturbing, and Well-Written. Says, I had seen this author compared to other more well-known extreme horror authors, such as Jack Ketchum and Richard Lehman. So I decided to check Valley's book out, not really knowing what to expect. I say this as as a fan on extreme horror. A Gathering of Evil is one of the most disturbing books I have ever read. The characters are developed so well, especially the women who had been targeted by the villains. You really want to pull for them, even though you have an idea of how bad it is going to get for them while they go about their daily lives. The writing is detailed, chilling, and sounds real. 
I thought it ended a bit too quickly. I don't want to give any spoilers, but I personally would have liked to read more of the truly graphic and violent stuff. Perhaps the author felt that less is more and intentionally left the reader to fill in the blanks. So still, if you're looking for a story that is going to make you uncomfortable, I highly recommend this book. I finished it in one sitting. What a ride. I look forward to whatever Valley writes in the future. How many pages is it? Mm. 105. 187. How much do we want to bet that this man gave himself five-star reviews on Amazon? I don't know, but somebody left a one-star review titled Truly Fascinating, an unfiltered look into the mind of a clearly disturbed individual. While I'm not one to be overly sensitive to graphic subject matter, this book displays the raw and downright bizarre sexual fantasies of Gill Valley. The author focuses on the theme of, of unbeknownst fate from the perspective of the book's victims, as well as the detailed and technical explanation of the process of torturing and cooking, quote, girl meat, unquote. From a literary view, this book is written rather simplistically and lacks true poetic rhythm, plus is very repetitive at times. All in all, this piece is a sad attempt at, quote, murder porn, South Park term, <laughs> and can hardly be classified as a, quote, book from a deranged individual who, IMO, should not be given internet access. Also, are we sure this guy isn't guilty of something? <laughs> Did you write this review? I <laughs> He's writing all the five-star ones. I'm writing all the one-star ones. <laughs> Another one-star one says uh, is titled Psychopath and says, I threw this book away after about 20 pages. Made me feel sick to read it due to sick. I do feel like I, like I can see this guy since he, he chose a – initially chose a field where he I feel like was kind of setting him up for – the shit that he wanted to be really spending his time doing. I can also see him releasing this book to reaffirm his, see, it's just a fantasy. Mm -hmm. I just really wanted to be an author. Meanwhile, he's probably cooking and eating people. Well, the good news is that he's also written a book called The Social Catalog of Hashtag Prey. Like, it doesn't say the word hashtag. It actually just has a hashtag in the title. Um, and Lake Tahoe 10 Killings, Raw Deal, The Untold Story of NYPD's Cannibal Cop, and a short story in Red Room, Issue 1, Magazine of Extreme Horror and Hardcore Dark Crime. So since 2018, he's released a bunch of really bunch shitty of books. books. Yep. Self-published so, shitty books. I don't know if it's self-published. I'm just assuming it's self I'm just salty because... <laughs> I want him to fail at everything he does. Um, let's see if it lists the publisher here. I think it's interesting that like, like a lot of his books, there's either a co-author or like the editor is featured in the title. <laughs> like, Yeah. Cause they, he probably gave them like the manuscript for it and they read it and they were like, this is fucking trash. And I'm going to have to spend so much time editing this that I need to be listed as a co-author. <laughs> The publisher is Comet Press, so I don't know who that is, but Girl Meat Press. It's not <laughs> certainly not Random House. It's no, it's not, and it's um, its rank in horror literature and fiction is fifty nine thousand one hundred eighty five. <laughs> its rank in suspense thrillers is sixty nine thousand four hundred ninety, <laughs> and its overall rank in books is two million. 2005 that's the best part of this whole thing <laughs> that is so great <laughs> but yep he has got books yeah that was um i remember watching that documentary and it was just like it's just so disturbing it's just so unsettling it was just really interesting the part where the psychologist was like if you're giving in to these urges by quote-unquote coping and engaging in these these fetish websites mm -hmm. you're not coping you're desensitizing your brain to oh you're the upping urge. the ante yeah, yeah. like you're and just getting deeper into it some at some point in the documentary they also said like basically like if somebody is a pedophile you don't tell them we'll just go online 
just to watch the pre- stuff online. Just pretend you're acting it out in your head. Right. Like that's not what you tell them. Like it doesn't no. cure you of it. No, it's like you need to go to therapy and you need to find a way to disconnect the sexual component of this with like the urges and unpack the urges. And I think the the real the real harm of his fetish is not because BDSM is consensual. Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's not that it's BDSM. It's that what he was fantasizing about was non-consensual. It, it's the exact same thing as Army Hammer mm-hmm. in that he's not into BDSM. Right. And he's that's not his thing. He wasn't targeting people that had experience with that. His, his like, the, the fetishy part of this is the instilling fear in another person yeah. and the control and the the sadism that goes with it yes apparently when discussing his wife in these these chats he said the rape will be the easy part for her and like then goes into these horrific details of her torture and murder and consumption of her body what the fuck I, it's just wild and it was the kind of thing like i was watching it yesterday like afternoon it wasn't late but it was the kind of thing where it's like what the fuck would i do if i found shit like this on pk's phone or on his computer yeah like like if you found out that your spouse talked about you like this yeah at all like if he had a private note on his phone where he was like man i can't wait to shove garrett in the oven for context i got mad when he jokingly one time said the old ball and chain (laughs) so I would not respond well, but you know what? Honestly, like the more I think about it, I am like super proud of that wife for like oh, I know. immediately. And even if she had been compiling this for a month, you still like, I, I don't blame her because you need a fucking plan. Well, you need a plan. And it is that thing where it's like, I would have to check in with a friend. Yes. And be like, um, this is like, what's going on. The hair is sticking up on the back of my neck. I think I'm going to barf. But, like, I need to verify with you that I'm not overreacting here. Yes. Like, does your spouse do this? <laughs> and also, I mean, similar to, like, a domestic violence situation mm-hmm. because this guy is a police officer. Well, and it's that thing where you can't – like, she said in one of her texts to him, like, you know, I don't know who you are. Like, is the one of you that loves me the one that married me or the one of you that wants to eat me the one that married me? Yeah. Like, which one – and, you know, he's, like, trying to convince her that he's – not and that le- guy. And, like, let's be realistic. The likelihood of her going to the police and it being swept under the rug. Super high. Which then, I, I'm guessing is why this ended up being an FBI thing. Yeah. And not... Um, an NYPD case. I mean, if she could have ended up... His yeah. plan could have been real. Because he could have flown into a rage or, and yeah, fucking cooked And it could have been not even that he wants to, you know, eat her or whatever and torture her. But if his urge is to kill something, yeah, and so he's going to this extreme as like, oh, I'll never do that, but I still want to, you know, Long Island serial killer it mm-hmm. and whatever. Well, he's got the means. He has a service weapon. Yep. He's he's beloved in his community. You know, he he looks dopey. Like yes. he he had this like boy's buzz cut. Like it was just yes. like the same layer. Or same length of hair all yeah. around. And it was like this little hedgehog cut. Dopey is a really good way to put it. Like, like I saw him and I was like, that's the dude. Like, no wonder he had to tie women up. Because who else would date him? And that's the thing. Like, you know, I'll watch like a Ted Bunny documentary. And I think to myself, this motherfucker definitely would have gotten me. Because he looked normal. Could like I didn't be think, charming. I never thought that when I saw actual photos of Ted Bundy. But I was also seeing them knowing that it was Ted Bundy. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. you know, especially when he was wearing, like, the 70s serial killer glasses. Right. I'm like, no, that's gross. But when you think because about Because I also terms... associate those glasses with, like, grandpas. So, like, because that's, <laughs> like, everyone's grandpa has yes. those glasses. This serial killer grandpa's not going to get me. But then when that Zac Efron movie came out, I was like, oh, for sure. Zac oh, Efron, yeah. yeah. Army Hammer? Like, if you're messaging me from a verified account and you're... Six foot five and fucking real good looking. Yeah, you probably would have gotten me at least to a degree. So it's I would like probably have at least had the conversation. Like I would have talked to you. Yeah, yeah. This trolley guy. But yeah, Zach Efron with a broken arm. Absolutely, I'll help you, sir. You need like, to put your canoe on your roof. Sure. Let me you like it when me... I bend over. Oh. Like... <laughs> Should I pull my shirt down a little bit, like so you see some cleavage before I help you, or <laughs> you just want me to pull it up? Okay. Sure. 
<laughs> Would it be better if I did this shirtless? Do I get beads? <laughs> Oh my god we're horrible <laughs> i know but it's true though because it's the yes. kind of thing where like i look at this guy and i'm like ew yeah and like yeah. every time they interview him in the documentary he has these like really dark circles yes. on his eyes. i'm like oh so you're still doing the 3 a.m forum thing yes <laughs> cool and that's all i can think is like he's definitely delved farther into whatever this is because he's now trying to profit well, off it right and now it's his job is to write these it's his thing yeah, yeah. so yeah i um which is also shitty because now it means that his ex-wife, I think, I think it's his ex-wife, and Got child, me. like, if she's getting alimony and child support, that money comes from oh, him profiting I didn't even think about that. Of, yeah, him I profiting off of his fantasizing of killing her. Oh, I hate that. Yeah. Yuck. Yeah, it's real gross. But, like, oh, I don't know, cash is cash, I mean... Zac Efron, you know, like, needs well, help. Like, what am kid, I going to do? You know, the kid needs braces or whatever, yeah. you know? Like, so, um, yeah, it's just wild. And, like, yeah, now that child is, what, 12, 13? So, oh, just nuts. Yeah, that was a crazy – that was a crazy documentary. It was a crazy case. It was. And I'm glad that it was – it's on HBO, like I said, if you want to watch. It's an hour and 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. So, it's just one thing, like a movie. Yeah. Um, Which I liked because, like, as much as, like – episodic documentaries are fine Mm -hmm. um you know for purposes of a a recap an episode and for to be able to like research it and then like look into the law and read the the case like i'm glad that it wasn't like six hours of watching tv yes (laughs) whereas i want the six hour one and then i just want to um come on and kind of sound like when charlie was working in the mailroom on always sunny and he's talking about who is pepe Silvia. Um, that's kind of how I do recaps. <laughs> so then Army's grandfather. That is true. <laughs> uh, you really should tune into Patreon though, because that was that was that was I had no idea. I was gobsmacked that was, by that one. Yeah. Also gobsmacked by uh Bob Barker. So Yeah. Yeah. I mean it's like it it's I don't know, it's enjoyable doing these like random deep dives. Mm-hmm. Well, and again, like I said, the I was really – it really piqued my interest. Like, my ears perked up when they started talking about, like, following – like, indulging in those urges because, like, like for ADHD, like, impulsivity is, like, a huge problem for us. And, like, mm-hmm. potentially, you know, going after those impulses, if you are saying, you know, oh, well, it's just ADHD because I have, like, impulse control issues that I clicked this link and Googled this random thing. Well, yeah, I Google random shit all the time. Like, how much does a whale heart weigh? And like, <laughs> yeah, I, um, so like I Google random shit, but like, does yeah. that mean, and I Google it on my work computer. Our running joke in our house is like the strange watch list that I must be on because every fleet. <laughs> I know I really got to start using it like incognito tabs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> at least I mean, at I, home. <laughs> I will Google stuff on my phone as like, I don't Google stuff on a work computer, but, uh, pretty much anything I think of. Something came up and I don't know what it was and I it was a few years ago. It was like a news story I saw or something. I was like something about bomb making. <laughs> Cut to me like Googling it. And he's like, what the fuck are you doing? Are you out of your mind? I'm like, I want to know. Well, that's just it. Like he's Googling how to make chloroform and it's like, okay, well, I mean, how do you make it? Like, is it, there that a way? Was, you said that and in my head I was like, how do you make chloroform? <laughs> but now I don't want to Google it. And granted, just that was wait like. Till you're at work. Yes, <laughs> on the work computer, because they can't catch you because of the poop hole loophole. <laughs> so you can keep your job and you won't get a. The federal anymore. government said that you can't, you can't find me criminally liable for frolic <laughs> at work. And if chloroform is anything, and if frolic. anyone's going to frolic at work, it's going to be me. That's yeah. for sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was good. That was a good. Uh, that was a good episode. Creepy. Yeah, I liked it. It was. Um, it was just interesting and like kind of like. Obviously, this isn't a true crime podcast, but it it was – the idea of, like, thought crime was compelling. And impulsivity and that, that blurred line between, like, fantasizing. Right. And – Especially with how much we've talked about, like, daydreaming. Because, like, yeah. daydreaming is just a fantasy. Like, let's right. be real. It's just yeah. not a fetish fantasy. Yeah. Hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like how we hedge our bets every time. <laughs> We're both, like, really confident and then, like, well, you know, <laughs> hopefully not. Fingers crossed. <laughs> also, if our listeners get arrested, you don't know us. 
No. We've never talked about it. We never mentioned Zac Efron. We're like, look at all these five star reviews this person left for the bar's ankle high. We should call them. Hmm. What did they what else did they leave reviews for? Oh, one star review for this girl meat book. That's weird. <laughs> Um, yeah, so also in the show notes, in addition to the sources, it'll be closer to the top, is that link where you can go to the People's Choice Awards, uh, People's Choice Podcast Awards and nominate us for um, either the People's Choice Podcast, Favorite po- Comedy Podcast, or Favorite Health Podcast. We're in all of those categories. Um, we'd love to win, obviously, because we're like the coolest, but also like we really need you guys to nominate us. <laughs> So it'll Please. it'll ask you to verify your your email. So you do have to enter your email, but they don't really send out a bunch of emails. I so. haven't gotten any emails. No, um, me neither. And I've only gotten an email because I registered us, yeah. saying like make sure people are voting for you. Right. <laughs> but um, yeah. So make sure you do that. That is open um from July first to July thirty first, twenty twenty three. So don't delay. Do it right now as you're listening, unless you're driving. Um, in which case just pull over and do it right away. Um, Definitely is the only option. Yeah. Cause well, you'll forget. <laughs> I mean, yeah, we love you, but you'll forget. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, yeah. Then in the meantime, you know, just clear your browser history or use an incognito tab. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> and be with somebody for more than three years before you get married and have a child. Yeah. Probably better, yeah. Because holy shit. Woof. Yeah, because the bar is ankle high. And don't... Yeah, the bar is... <laughs> the bar is in hell in this one, too. <laughs> um, And we'll be here next Thursday. Yes. Um, With a new episode, you can follow us on Instagram, at the bar is ankle high. You can join our Patreon if you want ad-free episodes. All of our Anklets and Limbo Champion subscribers get ad-free episodes while Garrett is on maternity leave, which is... Coming up. <laughs> I'm going to have an existential this, crisis like, real quick. <laughs> in like two or three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> but, but um, so you can join our Patreon at patreon.com slash the bar is ankle high. Uh, do you want to do the merch one? Billy! <laughs> if you go to bit.ly slash ankle high merch, you can check out our merch. Uh, it ships internationally, so no harm, no foul there. You can get what you want. And because it's through Zazzle, you can get our designs on, like, pretty much anything you want um, to suit your needs. So go for it, I'd say. Um, And, yeah, that's it. That's all I got. Um, Vote for us for the podcast. Yeah, vote for us. Do it. Do it now. (laughs) Right now. We'll see you next Thursday. (laughs) Bye. Bye. Bye.